basically. Come in. Yep. Okay, hello, welcome. This is uh, the diversity okay. training workshop. Uh, I'm joined by a couple of wonderful people here, so we're going to do introductions in just a moment, but I wanted to start off by uh, just welcoming everybody to, to what is, I think, our first official diverse, specific diversity training for Games on Demand. Um, we have been blessed by wonderful GMs week after week, month after month. Every time I go to Games on Demand, I'm blown away by how many great GMs there are, and we, don't, we, like, we haven't even started training or anything. Just, they just show up, and uh, we're just so honored to have so many people give their time that we thought it'd be great to do some training to help those great GMs be even better. Um, and we've had a lot of talk in our community over the last couple of years about diversity, about bringing in new people, about being inclusive. Um, and so we scheduled this time to really set aside that issue specifically. Um, and I want to thank Kira, who's going to introduce herself in a moment, for leading some of that effort with the broader Games on Demand team um, to make it happen. But um, I'm going to be the moderator today for this cool discussion about uh, how to make diversity work in your games. Um, and my name is Mark, um, and I'm the... Uh, do a lot of different things in the gaming community. I do some design work, um, run a lot of games at conventions with Games on Demand, um, and I'm part of a group called Indie Plus that does some uh, some group uh, hangouts and, and various gaming online. So this is a, a subject that I spend a lot of time talking about. It's also a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I come from Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is way off in the middle of nowhere. That's where I am today. It's beautiful and sunny outside, um, but it's, it's a diverse community that I grew up with, and I want to bring that to... Um, you know, my, my Latino heritage and the world that I come from to gaming. So I'm excited to help train people on how to do that effectively. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Ajit first to introduce himself, and then we'll, we'll go down the line. So, Ajit. Hey, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Ajit George. I, uh, my full-time job, I'm a director of operations for an international nonprofit. Um, within the gaming community, I uh, mostly am a player. I help organize... Um, the tracks for LARPs and for tabletop games, uh, but one of my main focuses really within the community is uh, thinking about and talking about uh, diversity uh, within the community and how do we represent um, uh, non-white characters, uh, characters from different backgrounds, uh, how do we draw more players into the community who are from uh, non-white backgrounds, and uh, I'm really excited to, to discuss today how we can help uh, GMs uh, and be more inclusive in the role play. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Mendez? Uh, hi, uh, I'm James Mendez Hodes, uh, but pretty much everyone calls me Mendez. Um, I have been a gamer since, I guess, the beginning of college, and it may be like 2004. Um, and I've been at uh, a lot of games on demand events over the past uh, three years or so. Um, uh, for my job, uh, right now I'm starting a job as a, as a tutor, but um, for the past year I've been doing a lot of professional GMing, um, uh, especially as, uh, as part of after-school programs when, uh, when you're a little kid, uh, for little kids. Um, so I've done a lot of professional GMing for those groups, and then also a little bit for adults. Um, and yeah, um, uh, bringing diversity to games has always been a passion of mine um, ever since um, I started gaming. And I'm really excited to to help people um, bring a lot more bring a lot more breadth and uh, a lot more depth to uh, the games that they'll be running at Gen Con. That's great, wonderful. Um, Kira, last but not least. Awesome. Hi, um, I am Kira McGran, and I organize Games on Demand um, events at Gen Con and Origins with a bunch of awesome people. And uh, I also blog for Gaming as Women, and um, I've been GMing and gaming for about 15 years uh, professionally. I work at an art school in Columbus, Ohio, um, and I'm also an artist. Uh, but I care a lot about diversity in gaming. Um, I care a lot about um, diversity. I care a lot about um, inclusivity uh, as regarding race and gender and sexuality of players and characters, um, and in the design of games, the inclusive design of games. So. Uh, but mostly we're going to be talking about uh, convention games, uh, say like one shots and gaming with people you might not know, and, and especially games on demand, so, which is a, a particular creature unto itself. Yeah, totally. Um, so let's, let's jump into that a little bit. First, we're going to go through and just have each uh, person talk a little bit about some intro tips on how to, how to do this well. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge out there. We just want to highlight a couple of things that are near and dear to our hearts that have worked for us as individuals. 
Um, and then we're going to take on some of the questions that Kira very generously curated from our, our list of, uh, our list of uh, folks, Games on Demand folks, and tackle some of the questions that have come up. But we don't want that to obscure the questions that you can ask during the session. So if you're watching right now, uh, there's a question and answer button on the YouTube video or on the, on the event page. And you can click that and ask questions, and we'll try to get to some of those later. So feel free if you've got questions about diversity or questions about things that we've said, uh, ask them, and we'll see if we can get to them either during the Hangout or, or right after. All right, great. So let's let's transition over to talking about these opening tips. So Andre, why don't you get us started? What's, what's some of the first things we should be thinking about when we're trying to bring uh, inclusivity and support diversity in gaming? Sure, Mark. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think about, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one of the things I think about um, often with uh, how people of color are represented or women are represented in popular media as uh, they're Jewish generally represented as sort of sideline characters, uh, minor characters, supporting characters, or white male protagonists. And I think that also translates often into uh, tabletop RPGs and LARPs. And so one way to defy that expectation uh, and subvert it and actually make these uh, characters make people of color real three-dimensional characters uh, and uh, full-fledged characters and make women have uh, dominant roles is to actually put them in roles that are normally expected for the white male protagonist or, or the white male um, central character. Uh, have them be an important NPC leadership roles or have them um, be the one who saves the day or, or the one uh, that has, you know, uh, the information you need. I just put them in more primary roles as NPCs. Uh, and give them, flesh them out a little bit. They have given them a little bit of depth. Uh, I think instead of just being supporting roles and supporting casts or just the, an obstacle for the, um, for the PCs or, or, or just a very uh, uh, minor role, if you have them in more primary roles that you often think of as the as a white male protagonist or the white male um, NPC, it, it really gives uh, a greater level of diversity uh, and um, dimension to the game. Totally. Yeah, that's a good thing for the rest of us might be to give some examples of that. A, a good trope that we can play on with that, I think, is the um, the matriarch figure is one that I think shows up a lot in my games uh, of this of a, a woman who's risen in power and has you know this and this is not you know, historically common. In fact, to have you know the queens and other people who are who are leading organizations. So you think about Gwendolyn from Mouse Guard. Is this you know she's she's brilliant and capable and strategic. Um, even in the newest Guardians of the Galaxy movie, the Nova Prime is a woman, right? And so this is something that's like it's not crazy to add that to your game. It's not it doesn't throw everything off to have that that be somebody who's in charge. Uh, Kira, Mendez, do you have any other ideas of where you've seen this work really well? Um, yeah, uh, Kira, why don't you go ahead? Oh, as far as like putting someone uh, in charge who isn't normal, like a oh, like just, just male subverting. protagonist. Yeah, like subverting the narrative, right? Like doing something a little different. Oh, totally, yeah. One thing that I love doing in Monster Hearts is uh, taking a teenage trope, uh, like the popular jock uh, football player, and um, making him, uh, you know, not a white guy, but maybe, um, you know, uh, a black character um, who is still an antagonist, but then, oh, what a twist, maybe he's gay, and he just needs some love and attention. Um, you know, like taking characters that you typically see on TV or whatever and changing maybe their race, their gender, their sexuality to, to subvert those typical roles that you often see. That's awesome. That's a good one. Yeah. Mendez? Um, yeah, uh, I guess just uh, springboarding off of that, um, actually the, the TV idea, that can often provide uh, some good inspiration because uh, one thing that I, I think about when I'm creating one of these, these kinds of characters that I've talked about is... Um, I think in my head, like, what actor would I cast? Um, what actor would I cast in this role? Um, and just thinking over, like, you know, I've, I've been watching a lot of community. So um, when I think of, like, popular, attractive high school kids, like, often I'll throw, uh, I'll throw Donald Glover in there. Um, or, you know, Donald Glover or, you know, Danny Pudi, uh, those two characters come up a lot in my games. Um, and then if you're not uh, if you're not much of a TV watcher, um, if you're, maybe your thing is comics, um, and you can think of like uh, you can think of comics characters who are who are off the beaten path as sort of a uh, sort of an archetype to base your base your character on. So use things you know, use things that you're familiar with and which you've seen worked in work in the past, and don't be afraid to copy something that works. Totally, cool, good, thanks, Ajit. I think that's a great tip. 
Um, good. Uh, Mendez, how about you? What's a good opening tip for our, for our viewers? Oh, sure. Um, so a little bit of forethought often goes a long way in terms of being able to, to include diverse characters in your games. Um, so one situation that every GM uh, has seen or is about to see um, is uh, having to improvise an NPC. You're going to make someone up. Uh, as you know, sort of a walk-on or an extra, and the characters might that you might need them to do something important, or the characters might latch onto them and uh, really draw them into the story in an important way. Um, and one of the first things the characters are going to ask, or the players are going to ask, is what's this character's name? So, at this point, it could be really useful to have a couple of name lists. Um, you know, I like to pull up like baby name websites or have the story games name book with me. And when I'm bringing one of those, like, random characters in, you know, instead of just naming him, you know, Bob Smith, uh, like every other random character, um, I'll give him a Spanish name. And then maybe he could be Filipino or he could be South American. I'll give him, uh, I'll give him an Indian name. Um, if you're setting a game in the United States, for example, like, there's lots and lots of examples. Um, uh, even if you're trying to give, like, a really strong sense of place, um, if you're setting a game in Texas, um, there's a lot of Indian Americans in Texas. There you go. Um, and having that name list uh, close at hand can allow you to bring that in without it being stressful and without it uh, taxing your creativity. Yeah, cool. What are some of the other tools you all uh, use, Kira? Are there other tools you use to prepare the way that Mendes is talking about name lists that have worked for you to make it a more inclusive environment? Oh, yeah. Um, just going off of things like name lists and stuff like that. Or... Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's great. Uh, pictures are awesome, too. I know that one thing that, um, oh, my God, Rachel Walton, who's working on the long orbit that she'll finish one day for me so I can play it, uh, she, she includes a lot of pictures of uh, different characters that are of various genders and races. So that you just have that to choose from when you're sitting down to play. You don't have to think about it. It's just a visual. Then you can just go to that. So I think that's that's like a useful tool is having images that people can just be like, yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. But maybe I didn't. I wouldn't have thought that at first if I didn't have that image in front of me. Totally. I do a lot of. Um, uh, John Wick has a technique in his games for uh, making characters interesting, but then letting the players fill in more interesting things. A lot of his games have mechanics for players saying true things about characters. And the rule is like three true things. So you say three true things before anybody else says anything, right? So you can say like this person is, you know, a venture vampire. They wear suits all the time, and they carry a little black book around everywhere, right? And so one thing I try to do is I try to think of a lot of those things independent from each other, not like three true things all together, but like, th you know, ten true things that could be true about characters, right? So like, you know, this person has a daughter uh, that they care a lot about, and you've seen them with often. Right, so then there's, hey, there's a female character and another NPC that might actually be important to the story rather than just like a total side character. That's important enough that I made it true early. Right? So I, I try to come up with those things. And I don't necessarily always write them down, although that might be helpful. You're prompting me to kind of think about whether I should get them written down. But I, I try to have like this constant brainstorm of what, what makes these characters interesting to me and what would make them interesting to my players. And can that be diverse or is it going to be the same five things? They carry a cool sword every single time. Ajit, uh, anything else you prepare for your games in terms of this kind of tools and paraphernalia? Um, I, I think, um, you know, especially if I'm thinking about people of color, I try to think of uh, if, if um, you know, I'm going to do random NPCs and, you know, Mendes' list of, of names, um, let's say uh, I might try to focus in, in a particular game on a particular set of uh, maybe ethnic backgrounds uh, or just a few. And then I try to pull into, like, uh, you know, tropes or at least... Um, uh, values that you, you know that the culture uh, has, a domi has a dominant theme with. So for Indians, uh, often family is a reoccurring theme for Indian, fam uh, for Indian families yeah. or Indian characters. And so, sure, the NPC might be um, I think a RAM NPC, but then suddenly like, like they have a, a brother that they really care about, and they, they, um, they have parents that they need to take care of later in life, and they're kind of like you know working that through. And those little small pieces of flavor, like just saying that you know this this Indian character is not just you know his name is you know so and so, but like he actually also has a couple of extra things about him that speaks to his cultural background, uh, gives a little bit more dimension and depth to the character. And so I kind of think about uh, in that direction when I'm when I'm um, trying to uh, flesh out my NPCs. 
Totally, totally. Good. Uh, Kira, how about you? Do you have some opening tips for us to share? Thanks, Mendez. That was awesome. Thanks. Uh, Kira, what, what about you? Yes. Um, so uh, usually, uh, well, a, a simple thing that I do is um, if I'm sitting down to play a game or uh, run a game, I think about uh, races or genders or sexualities that might not be represented in this game um, or that aren't represented by other people at the table. And I try to create a character or an NPC uh, just to represent that gender or that sexuality or that race. So doing that in and of itself, like representation isn't everything right. Um, but just having that character and attaching um, those things to that character creates a more inclusive atmosphere for everybody that everybody can kind of see. You can lead by example by doing that, um, and other people will do that as well. I think creating diverse NPCs is super important too, which we've already talked about a little bit, like um, the chance did. Um, so, and, and having that list and just even thinking about stuff that you might not think about, that you might not automatically include, don't go to your first idea, like think about it a little bit, go to your second or third idea maybe. There's an interesting thing you said there to me about um, having to take the lead, right? And I think part of what we're getting at here, that's maybe some subtext right now but that we should lift up, is the idea that you know, diversity is unlikely to happen on its own or by accident. Um, it's actually on you as the GM to make that space welcoming and available. Um, so I know one thing that is done often, especially like in the upper northwest, is for people to ask what their gender pronouns are when you start play. Um, and one thing that I've done a couple of times and tried out, um, I'm not sure exactly how it plays out, but I think it's an interesting idea, is to ask people what their backgrounds are, where are you from, what matters to you, right? So, and then for me to be able to say, look, I'm from Albuquerque, I'm Latino, these are these, you know, I was raised Catholic, these are some of the things that are coming to my mind as like tropes and ideas and stories I bring to the table. And I love that you're talking about sort of taking responsibility for trying stuff and, and you know, getting out there in front of your players. Uh, so, Mendez, has there been some things you feel like you do to try to create that atmosphere, maybe even some risks you have to take to do that with your players as a GM? Uh, yeah. Uh, were you thinking more in terms of, like, like the like personal identity out of character or, like, in-game? Either way. I think Kira's touching on both, right? You're thinking about right. what's not at the table as well as what's not in the narrative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so one thing that I do sometimes... Um, uh, sort of to, to head off a possible bad situation. Um, a lot of times I'll sit down at a gaming table, either as a player or as a GM, um, and the game will turn out to be based on some pro um, that, uh, that could be a little bit dicey. Like someone introduces their character as, say, a voodoo practitioner. This is very common in like vampire games, for example, or uh, games with a lot of magic. And someone will come with this uh, like live and let die, snake handling, uh, freaky voodoo priestess or something like that. Um, and at a moment like that, uh, I, I kind of, I feel like I kind of have this choice between uh, you know, like, leaning over the table and being like, that's racist, um, which is not really what you want to do. Um, or I could maybe take a, a bit of a different angle towards it. So one thing I, I sometimes say is like, oh, that's really cool. Um, you know, I, I majored in West African, uh, West African religion in college, and uh, I have a bunch of friends who practice voodoo, and this is like this one funny experience that I had where I was at a voodoo bet and some gods hit on me. Um, or, you know, if someone says something about, like, you know, they have their Asian character and they're going to make an, another another Asian ninja or something like that, I'll be like, oh, hey, that's cool. Uh, I purchased ninja too. And like, um, so I'll bring in something from my own personal experience um, that is capable of kind of leavening that, uh, that moment where um, some character or some NPC is about to turn into like a possible terrifying stereotype. Um, and bringing in like a little bit of that personal experience um, it could be whether it's my own or like someone I know or something like that can often leaven that situation. That's interesting. Yeah, you got to jump in and sort of confront it. Yeah. Ajit, how about you? Anything you see as sort of really necessary leadership from the GM in those in those opening moments? Um, yeah, I think uh, you know if you the, the GM really uh, makes important like makes an effort to kind of set tone and uh, uh, explain things well. To the players right off the bat, um, and they're uh, creating the mindset. So, for instance, in the Cthulhu Dark uh, scenario, which I said in India, I think part of the A was looking at the Cthulhu Dark and saying, "Hey, uh, Cthulhu is usually uh, you think of 
you know, England or New England as kind of these settings. I wanted to defy expectations with that, and so I set it in uh, Bombay, uh, and uh, so that kind of uh, overturned the the normal narrative. And then uh, I kind of spoke in the very beginning a little bit about uh, the 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 area, the culture, the people. Um, and that really helped set the tone. I also showed some photos along uh, with it of the area and so uh, of the time period and the people. And I think um, doing those multiple tactics I felt brought the players in better. Um, and it made very clear that one of the things that they were going to be engaging with was about colonial, colonialism and India uh, as within a Cthulhu setting. Um, and so that primed the players within that direction of thinking about race, thinking about colonialism, thinking about, um, you know, non-white, uh, non-Western expectations. And that was helpful. Yeah, totally, totally. I think, so, uh, thank you for that, Kira. That's great, wonderful. Um, really thinking about, like, your role as the GM and how much of this rests on your shoulders. Um, for me, like, for my tip, I think going along those same lines, um, I, I try, I think it's really valuable to try to push on those stereotypes really pretty hard. Um, so when somebody comes to the table with something that's not very complex, to make it complex by asking questions and pushing on them, right, within the setting. So a great example will be we'll be playing, you know, Urban Shadows, which, you know, in, in the, the game that we're devising actually deals with race all the time. So, you know, we're constantly talking about people of different cultures and different races. But um, we talk about the, with those people about where they're from. So if you're, oh, you're Hispanic, great. What's your background? Where did you come from? And there could be a temptation in there if somebody says, well, I'm white, to be like, oh, okay, you're normal, thank you. Let's we'll just move on to the next person. You've answered all of my questions. Right? And what that does, and I've seen, I catch myself doing this, right? I'm not saying it's other people, it's me. Right? You know, I catch myself doing this of being like, oh, well, you're the norm. I'm interested in the people who aren't the norm. And part of that is challenging that norm and being like, what, so where is your family from? Right, like, because nobody in America is from here unless you're a Native American. You didn't say Native American, so you got you came here at some point. When was it? Right, and people start saying, "Well, maybe we came over after World War II." Great, so you know, what from where? And then we complicate that. Right, so if you're the if you're the straight white male fighter in Dungeon World, awesome. We I can just leave that, or we can complicate it. What's your region like? What are your cultural backgrounds? And with Apocalypse World in particular, I can kind of lead with questions like, "Your culture has a taboo." Something that it, it doesn't do, that's, that other people find strange or, or abnormal. What is it? Right? And they say, oh, well, we don't, we don't you know, drink alcohol. Great, wonderful, cool. So that straight white male fighter now has some hints of maybe some Islamic cultures in there that, that it's not you know, never explicitly called out because we're just playing a fantasy game, but is, but is a piece of it. So I think complicating white identities is as important to diversity as lifting up non-white identities. And I'd love to hear other thoughts on ways that you all have seen us be able to complicate those identities productively. Sure. Uh, I guess uh, one, thing that, uh, one thing that comes up sometimes, uh, and again, with a character that otherwise might seem like uh, sort of like an average like white male protagonist, that kind of thing, is um, so race and diversity and culture are really obvious ways uh, to bring that, uh, that kind of diversity into a game. Um, but uh, I think uh, gender and sexuality is another place where, especially in gaming, we have a great deal of uh, a great deal of freedom in terms of how we can maybe uh, upend some of those uh, standard tropes. Um, and then again, so with NPCs, uh, even if you're in you know a fantasy game that's ostensibly about combat, um, people are going to have relationships. People are going to have things that they care about, and people that they care about. Um, and uh, so that can and that can manifest really easily in terms of an NPC. And if you make that if you make that a situation that people know how to deal with, or the people are automatically going to get interested in, um, you know, you're uh, fighting alongside the samurai, and he tells you, "Okay, I'm really worried about uh, my boyfriend's squad. Uh, he's been there at the front lines of the battle, and I'm worried that he might have gotten captured. Can you guys help me with this?" Um, so then you're so you're presenting a character who has like a maybe a non-traditional uh, a non-traditional relationship, um, which uh, the players actually do kind of know how to deal with. They're thinking, you know, regardless of their thoughts or their experience with um, uh, with homosexuality, um, they might think, okay, well, that doesn't matter right now. Right now, we need to go and rescue this guy because this other guy cares about him. And it can bring, and then it makes something that was that might be otherwise strange uh, or a little scary to deal with seem familiar again. 
Cool, very cool. Ajit, any other any other thoughts about complicating those identities? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, referring off of what you were saying, Mark, about um, asking you know players who play white characters uh, complicated questions so that they are a little bit more engaged, even. Um, you know, I might ask, uh, let's say, like a character says that, you know, I'm a professor at a university. And I'm like, great, so uh, what race and gender is the president of that university? And because the norm is, hey, the leadership of that university is normally going to be a white male. Uh, and if I'm asking them, who's the leader of your company? Uh, what is their background? A little bit more, like, you know, your organization. Um, it, it really defies the normal expectation that which we automatically set it up, oh, well, of course the leadership's all going to be white males, but then now I'm asking you specifically, what is the leadership? Like, what is, who is behind the scenes? Uh, that forces the player to maybe develop a more complex um, background for their character, even if they are playing a white male. Uh, they can pull in uh, women, women of color, uh, transgender, uh, queer, like they can think about these different identities um, or these important roles that play very much into the structure of their background. Your neighbors, what are your neighbors? You know, what, what's the, what's their background? You know, these are these are questions that like I try to push their players to ask, even if they are they themselves are saying that their characters are quote unquote normal. Yeah, totally good. Kira, any final thoughts on that before we move on to answering some questions? Uh, yeah, totally. I, I really like, by the way, your idea of complicating um, white identities. That's awesome. Uh, just the way that you put that is awesome. It really stuck with me. Uh, and one one way I think that uh, um, one thing well a couple of things I often think about are tropes uh, so typical tropes that you might see in fantasy or sci-fi genres um, you know who is the victim who are you rescuing uh, usually it's the white female or the exoticized the exoticized sexualized female um, how can you change that to be something else <laughs> uh, you know and maybe it's not the romantic interest right so uh, think about that it's like one of the number one things that we often do who who needs rescuing here maybe it's a guy uh, another thing um, that's cool thing to you uh, is uh, oh, I just I lost it I had another thing Oh well, that that was maybe my my number one trope. Uh, but but thinking about subverting tropes like that, um, as far as like who who um like what the the white trope typically is, and kind of uh, complicating that by changing that around. Oh, good, good. So on that note, right, we're gonna we're gonna jump to some questions. But I think one of the questions that left out to me as being the one that I get the most often when talking with people about running diverse games, and we should explain that underlying all of this is sort of a theory of change, right? We're, we're hoping that as we build diverse narrative that they're both good because they're interesting and different and new, but also that they're welcoming to people that otherwise might leave the table a little, you know, shook up or, or put off by, by what they saw. So one thing that I get asked a lot by people, uh, and this is something I think about too, is how can I non-problematically, so in a good way, in a good way, not in a bad way, role play people, genders, races, or cultures that I am not a part of or don't know a lot about especially when most of what I do know is from TV or movies, right? And I think the idea there is basically most of what I see is racist, right? Most of what I see is sexist. Most of the tropes that we, that we are exposed to are not positive. How can I possibly go from that limited base of knowledge to playing races and cultures that aren't my own? Uh, and uh, I'd love to, love to have some, some of you jump in here and talk about, well, how can we can contextualize and philosophize about that? But also, like, how do you do it, right? So not just theoretically... How can you do that? But what do you do at the table to do so when you we have limited information? Uh, so I guess uh, one place that uh, that you might start um, is in your in your attitude towards the issue. I mean, the fact that you're asking the question, you know, how can I do this? Like that's great. Um, you know, you've you've made the important first step. Um, and uh, so it's it's helpful to have a couple of ground rules for sort of for yourself or your, for your approach to this kind of thing. Um, and the first uh, the first one that I, I always like to bring up is when you're approaching a problem like this or a question like this, you have to be okay with failing, apologizing, and improving upon your mistakes. Um, you've I, we've all heard politicians or celebrities or something like that get out there and say something terrible and then make some horrible non-apology where they're like I'm sorry if anyone was offended or something like that don't be that guy um, you want to you want to be uh, aware that you're gonna have failures and you're gonna have things that work less well than other times and you got to uh, you got to be uh, critical of your own successes or failures you got to listen to people who are criticizing you or making suggestions and you got to be committed to uh, to improving to listening and improving 
Yeah, good. So part of that's just taking risks and trying it and, and exactly. getting feedback. That's good. Yeah. But Kira, what do you think? What are, what are some of the ways in which we non, non-problematically and the best ways do this kind of work? Sure. This is a hard question. <laughs> um, uh, I think that there, you're always taking a chance that something will be problematic. Uh, I know a whole lot about gender and sexuality, and I still make mistakes all over the place. Uh, so, you know, even regarding my own gender and sexuality when playing games. Uh, so um, I think uh, when it comes to playing something other than you, uh, respect is really important. Um, and what you want to do is kind of not create a caricature, but just imagine a human being um, and imagine what they would do. Imagine what you would do in that character's shoes. There's always a little bit of lead when you role play um, between you and your character. You know, you're driving this character. Whatever this character does is a part of you and what you want it to do. Um, so uh, first and foremost, remember that that character is a person. Uh, secondly, uh, think about their race and their gender um, and maybe important things about them. Um, you know, maybe do a little bit of research depending on how in-depth uh, this goes or if it's talking about setting, you know, it is setting that's in Japan. You know, maybe you're not from Japan, you don't know much about Japan. How do you do that? You know, you do the best you can um, and you try and have respect at the table for it. Yeah, it's like respect for the source material, for, for the other players, for the culture you're talking about. And if you make a mistake, it's in the context of that respect rather than Dude, I just like Japan, so I thought I'd just set it there with like mostly white characters and Japanese people come on screen when I want them, right? But like, if you just approach it with that respect, it's a good starting position. Exactly. Aja, Aja, thoughts here on, on how do you do this tough work? Yeah, sure. I think Kira caught uh, a bit of what I was going to say, especially with regards to research. If you've got a little time in advance, uh, research is great. And I think one of the, uh, you know, a very specific way of doing research is, um, you know, like people are going to feel overwhelmed. Am I going to have to read tons of books about something? Yes, potentially you will if you want to create a full-fledged uh, setting, if you're building a game or whatever. But let's say you're, you're interested in playing a character. What I find in trying to understand the voice of um, somebody else that is not me um, uh, is to read essays of theirs online. Like if they've got like uh, like a, let's say like I I want to get a better sense of an Indian. Um, you know, maybe I'm trying to play an Indian character. How do I capture you know things that are important? And there's a lot of interesting Indian. Um, Indian writers or Indian American writers doing essays online in like the, the Atlantic or or uh, in a newspaper. They're just they're just talking about um, facts of life uh, back home uh, that, that are important to them, and that actually captures this real interesting sliver of their life, um, which uh, you know in, in just uh, like an hour you can read a couple of essays and you're like okay I have at least some sense of who they are, that this particular person is. Um, read the cross section of a few different uh, people from the ethnicity, and this is specifically talking to uh, issues of race. But that I think that'll really help. Um, I, I think just generally though is humanizing, right? Like so, don't ever make that person a stereotype or a, a caricature of their race. But um, there's some universal universalities I think of just being human. And so if you're going to play, um, you know, an Indian American character, understand that like. The, that person or he or she is still going to want probably some of the similar things that you want, and they're not going to be like uh, they're like not going to be like, hey, I want curry all the time, or they're going to be like, hey, I, I you know, uh, I, I have to go to the temple and pray, or whatever. Like these are things that are, like avoid the stereotypes and make them human, make them real. Yeah. And I think yeah. that, uh, that is a real great first step uh, in avoiding the large pitfalls. Yeah, it's. I had a player at my table who was playing uh, an aware in Urban Shadows who was playing a Rocky. Uh, or like a refugee, he'd come from Iraq to Chicago, and there was a scene in which one of the characters was drinking and kept trying to like push a drink in front of him, and he was like, "No, I'm not in your drink," and like he did it like three times, and I was like, "Wait a second, are you?" And the, I was like, out of character, I was like, "Oh, you're Muslim, Duh, of course, right?" But like there was this great moment in character where he was just playing a guy who had some specific. I don't drink. It's just like yeah. it's just part of what I what I don't do, and it was this beautiful moment of like. That was two cultures kind of rubbing up against each other, right? Like the the Russian immortal trying to talk to this Iraqi mortal, right? And then having the the Russian be like, "Oh, awesome, cool, that's that's fine, I don't care, <laughs> right?" And like there was just a cool moment between these two cultures that deal with these very this one thing in very different ways. And so like these, but at the same time, like I as a Latino don't walk around all the time being like, "Well, maybe I do want a taco most of the time." 
<laughs> but like, yeah, I also, you know, watch TV. Like, I just watch regular TV. So if, if you know, Indian characters come on screen and, like, spend 95% of their time doing stuff everybody else does, that's actually pretty accurate, right? That's, that's actually how it works in the real world, right? Yeah. All right, let's tackle the other side of that coin. Um, one of the questions we got is pretty much the effect of... Uh, I don't know how to get the best version of this. What if villains in my stories are people of color or women? Am I being racist? Right. So what <laughs> what happens if you know uh, the people the, the bad guys in my story are people of color or women or gay people? Uh, am I being racist, sexist, othering? Um, some people have said no, as long as they're real people. Um, but how do I how do I do that when when a lot of times villains are three stats on an index card and a short description, and then they're on screen fighting the, fighting the PCs or trying to involve the PCs. So, Ajit, I think it would be great to see you take the lead here. What, what is, how can we create villains of color, right, that, as an example, that are, are not racist? Yeah, um, so the, my first instinct is to say don't do it uh, unless um, you're actually engaging in a culture um, so the setting is like India, like so. If your entire like you're or you're in Chinatown or your the surroundings are all of a particular uh, of that ethnicity, I would say avoid doing it because the person of color, especially the person of color as a villain, uh, is always uh, painted um, in that trope, and and that's that's uh, very problematic and very difficult. However, if you do do it, or they are part of uh, your 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 setting is like uh, Mumbai, or or you know there's reasons to have it. Um, there's a couple of important ways to think about it. The first one is uh, make sure that you also have a really valuable, um, you know, uh, protagonists or positive uh, NPCs. You know, PCs, NPCs that are um, uh, caring and kind, decent, helpful, uh, that are show the the whole range of that culture. Not simply saying that well, that this the, the 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 villains are only Indian and like all the heroes are white. Uh, that's really really problematic. But if you have like a villain that's um, or an antagonist that's Indian, but then you also have a protagonist that's Indian, um, that shows uh, a range between the two, and that's great. I think the other way that I would look at it, if you're going to do this, um, if you choose to do it, is um, give them a little depth. And I know the person's like, well, I'm going to write a few stats on them, uh, so I don't have a lot of time to make a flesh out uh, a big background. But I always empathize with a villain, or at least understand a villain, if there's something about them that gives them a little vulnerability. A little bit of humanity, um, and three, st you know, a few stats on an index card doesn't mean you can't say that the person, the villain, um, doesn't um, mourn uh, a dead uh, son, or um, you know, um, uh, feels a frustration over a failed, you know, failure in life. You know, they can still have that dimensional, like that, like the three dimensional. You go, okay, this person's Indian, and I, but I really understand like what's going on with this character, even if there were adversaries with each other. And I think that's um, those are important things to think about. Yeah, I have some. I feel like I have some really strong feelings about this in the pro people of color as villains because it's so frustrating when we don't get to be villains and we're whitewashed, right? So watching you know uh, Ricardo Montalban play Khan is kind of like. Dude, we could be awesome, right? Like we could be, you know, but because Khan is awesome, right? So if it's, yeah. if you're an awesome villain, then yeah, let's do it, right? Like, I mean, we're all kind of sad when Darth Vader's mask comes off and it's not James Earl Jones. <laughs> that's, the, that's what makes him so great, right? Um, but yeah, it's it's got to be. You can't just be like, I want to kill everybody, right? Or like, I'm a gangbanger and I just do gangbanger stuff, right? Like even gangbangers do gangbanger stuff for reasons, right? Like they have motivations. And I think like you know, if we're if we're talking about um, you know, Alfred Molina played Doc Ock, and you know, Doc Ock has not traditionally been like Hispanic. Like that's not as far as I know, right? It's not like, but like he was in my reading totally Hispanic in Spider Man Two, right? And and yet this sort of drive to fix the science that killed his wife, like how can I like that's that's like classic, right? Like he was trying to do a good thing and it got out of control, and that's that's like something that I can kind of see in myself and see in others, and it feels human. Um, so I think that's, that can be valuable. Kira, do you have some, some other thoughts on this about you know villains and, and antagonists and how to present them without the you know because we also I think it would be bad to have the villain be the straight white guy in a suit on Wall Street every single time and be just as boring. <laughs> so what do you what do you I mean, recommend to do? Yeah. That's an okay model. I mean I'm not a fan. <laughs> <of that. laughs> is that, that's but, so bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm 
No, that's not good. Um, but no, I mean, the, pro the difficult thing, the problem with uh, systems of oppression, right, is that we all, regardless kind of of our gender or sexuality or race, like, are used to what the norm is and what the stories we tell ourselves are in, in America anyway, right? Um, so cultural norms here is that, like, villains, like, female villains in particular, I mean, look at Disney movies. Uh, you know, the evil stepmom is so tired and overdone. Um, and, and when you look at that, when you look at female villains and what they typically are, like, what are their motivations? Are they doing it for a man? Are they jealous? Is it because they want to be more beautiful? Uh, th think about things that are beyond those basic ideas. Um, like, kind of like Ajay was saying, or I can't remember if he said it, maybe Mark, um, make them real. Make them have real motivations and real histories that kind of move beyond uh, those simple things. Um, and I think it's really, it's a hard thing to do. You have to focus on it and think about it. Uh, so, uh, and I don't think it's wrong, actually. I think that, like you said, uh, the whitewashing of villains is also bad. It's a trap, right? You don't want to always have them be uh, the, you know, the, the minority uh, villain, but you don't always want them to be the white villain either. Like, we want some kind of in-between where there's representation across the board. Uh, so I don't think that you should not have uh, diverse villains. Um, but I think you really need to think about it. Like, it's really interesting right now running Night Witches. Uh, most of the characters and NPCs are women. Uh, and I've never actually played a game really like that, except for the LARP that I played two years ago now, Mad About the Boy, uh, where we were all women. Uh, and so when that happens, it's interesting when you have kind of a gender thing in play like that, where it's completely subverting what the norm is. Uh, that really affects the game in ways that I haven't seen it affect the game in other ways. Like when it really subverts something in, in the U.S. That's, that's a cultural standard. So I, I think about those things. Like think about cultural standards and, and how to kind of change them in clever ways. Yeah, I think it's important in that that it's not an easy lift, right? Like it doesn't get easy. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, well, you're all diverse characters, so we're done. Like we're, we're playing Urban Shadows with a new group and... Um, the characters that they created were three Latinos from South Central LA and a black woman from Atlanta who had moved to South Central. And I was like, oh, this is a TV pilot that would never get shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have no tropes, right? I have no tropes to call it. So I have to do all this extra work for me to, like, you know, really create a world here that, that is, is clicking. Uh, whereas, like, part of, part of what makes Monster Hearts work is, hey, we did this really smart thing to set it in, like, Buffy verse. So, like, I have all these tropes, but then give me ways to kind of, like, ah, undermine and play with it. So as we get further away from the baseline, the more work we have to do, right? And so just be be clear about it, be selective about it, be thoughtful about it, don't get sloppy. It's good. Yeah, definitely do it, though. Yeah, so <laughs> I, think, I think there's there's lots of value in being the bad guy because you have, the PCs have to deal with you. They can't they can't ignore you. You, you demand attention, right? It's good. I, I know we've got other questions too, and one that came up time and time and time and time again was, what if I screw up? How do I say I'm sorry in a way that makes sense? How do I let people know I'm interested in feedback without being condescending? How do I open up with, please tell me if I've done something? Like, how, do, how does that not come off as patronizing? Like, okay, poor brown slash female slash black slash minority people, if I screw up as the powerful white person, please tell me. You know, how, does that, how does that not come off as condescending? So, uh, and then maybe you have some thoughts here, working with kids especially, how do you how do you not come off as a condescending jerk when you try to set the boundaries here, and how do you apologize when you get it wrong? Oh, okay, sure. Um, so, uh, so with kids, it's sort of a it's sort of an interesting proposition because in they are sort of both more and less racist than adults, or more, both more and less uh, upset about, uh, or more or less hung up on like diversity or like sexuality issues or something like that. Um, yeah, working with kids, it's, uh, it's, it's a great example of like multiple extremes of this uh, issue because uh, in some ways they'll be completely unfamiliar with uh, tropes or uh, racial stereotypes or stereotypes that go along with like gender or sexuality or something like that. So I can, you know, I can have the, I can have the gay samurai character in there uh, all the time and I can just I can just keep going with that, and um, I can present that to a kid, and 
usually like there will be like a there will be like a split second, like a moment of confusion, um, and then the kid will accept it and go back to thinking about how to kill everything. Um, <laughs> Because kids are much more bloodthirsty than they are uh, racist or homophobic or anything like that. Um, but, um, and at the same time, uh, with a kid, like, if I'm an adult working with a kid, then I have an opportunity to shut down. Like, if someone, you know, puts on, like, the Ching Chong accent or the Arab accent, I can just kind of give them the adult glare, and then it will hopefully go away. Uh. Um, but uh, when you're dealing with adults... Um, it's a little bit more difficult because um, telling someone that they're uh, that they did something wrong, or having someone tell you that you did something wrong, it creates a power dynamic that is not uh, that is not the accepted norm uh, at a table. Um, because, like, I don't know, I don't like being like the omniscient god boss GM. Um, I like to feel like I'm more of an equal with the players. Uh, if you're using John Stavropoulos' X card uh, in your game and I highly recommend that everyone use it. It's you know it's it's its whole own thing, which I don't want to go into here. But basically, it's a tool. Uh, it's a card you can put on the table, which anybody can tap or lift up if they feel uncomfortable with something in the game. Um, having a system like that on the table um, allows you to introduce certain issues that you think might come up in your game and give people uh, a voice and a way of expressing their problem with it. So if I'm putting out an X card on the table and telling people, you know, you can go for this if you feel triggered, or you can go for this if you're uncomfortable with some content in the game, um, you know, if you're if you're about to run, like, your first game of Steal Away to Jordan or your first game of How We Came to Live Here, you can be like, hey, listen, this game might have some issues of racism in it. Um, and, uh, you know, and that might get difficult and that might get dicey. So, you know, if I say something wrong or another player says something that you don't feel comfortable with, you can go for this card, and then we'll just we'll work together to rewind and uh, to rewind and work it out. Uh, we'll work together to make it better, uh, and then it's, it'll be something that we all do. Cool, cool. Uh, Mark, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here because this actually came up uh, last night uh, um, in a non-role playing setting. Uh, so the apology, you know, if you're the person on the other end where you've made a mistake and you want to apologize appropriately. Um, here are some things to think about. Um, at the dinner party, it was myself, uh, another person of color, and another lady, and they're surrounded by like a bunch of white males. <clears throat> and there were two other women. Um, the, the conversation got very heated. Uh, two of the women, left, three of the women, left the table. They were just forced out. Um, the white males were kind of um, straight white males were just really kind of beating down on us about their opinion. And um, I think they clearly, I think part of them understood that they had made some mistakes, but what they were trying to do was justify themselves, right? They were trying to justify their actions, to justify their behavior. They were presenting anecdotal information to show that they were not racist, uh, that they were not being sexist. Um, they were doing everything um, under the sun to cover themselves and cover up their, their, their own actions. And so what I would say is stop, apologize as gen genuinely, and then listen. Like, listen to the party that you've just um, offended. And you may not like what they're about to say to you, but you've got to give them the, the, the time and the effort, uh, the opportunity to speak for themselves and explain to them, to you, why they're having a problem and what that problem is. And um, don't go in saying that, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry uh, you felt this way. But rather, you say sorry. I, you should say it like, "I am sorry. I did this. I did X." Um, you know, uh, don't make it about how they're feeling something that you probably don't really agree with. But rather, acknowledge that you did something in a way uh, that uh, affected them. And I think uh, taking personal responsibility uh, for that, and then really listening. You have to be willing to listen, and you have to be willing to to drop your normal defensiveness because we're all defensive. When, um, we all, you know, don't want to appear bad, but uh, you have to understand that sometimes you do make that mistake. Uh, there was an, a, a Korean American author who said something about the fact that, and this is about race, um, that white people seem sometimes more offended or, or more worried about appearing racist than actually engaging, like you know, knowing what racism feels like, being on the, on the uh, receiving end of racism. They don't want to look like a racist, so they'll say everything or do everything under the sun to show that they're not racist, and that's actually not productive. If you made a mistake, 
Uh, you have to apologize, and then you have to listen, and you have to understand and engage with the person or the group that you've made that mistake with and give them their time to speak. Um, and so that's, that's what I would really say. I, I, I was thinking about what happened last night. I was like, man, that was a train wreck, and that was a train wreck because they tried to justify their actions uh, for you know, for hours. <laughs> it was just a, it was a mess of a conversation. Yeah, so it's sort of like how do we keep the temperature down to a level people can talk, right? Because mm -hmm. because if you're on the side of the offended party, it also probably doesn't help the point to be like, racist, racist, right? It's not a good way to open, right? Because even though that might be how you feel, it's going to push that person in defensive mode. And then second, if you get pushed into that mode, we know a lot of social science research at this point that shows that uh, the majority of our amazing human intellect is devoted to defending and explaining that which we have already done. And very little of it goes towards thinking in advance about the things we're about to do. And that's not people of color, or white people, or that's just humans across the board. We know that we're not very good at being cautious and thoughtful. We like to defend what we've already done more than we like to think about it. And so it takes a lot to step back and say, okay, I don't understand. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm going to listen. And that's really tough to do. Kira, do you have some thoughts here about, about the, this listening piece? Sure, I'll just uh, wrap up with an anecdote. Um, I was running Night Witches a couple weeks ago, and um, we had a scene with one of my players, and she the scene was over, uh, and then one of my other players uh, looked, turned to her and said, oh, were you a little bit uncomfortable with that? Uh, and she said, yeah, actually, I think I was. Um, and then I was like, oh, was that something that I did as the GM with the NPC in your, in your scene? Because I didn't realize I did that. And she said, yeah, actually, I think I just wasn't expecting it to go that way based on my story. And this part in particular made me uncomfortable and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, what about that made you uncomfortable? Like, I asked her a question, kind of like what Ajit said. Like, you really need to listen. Like, if you upset someone or offended someone um, or something difficult comes up uh, that has to do with race or gender or sexuality, you basically apologize first um, and then you ask, well, what did I do? I didn't realize I did that. How can I do it better for you next time? Um, or, you know, what, what was the core issue that maybe I didn't see? Uh, yeah. And you listen to what that person has to say and then you learn something new. <laughs> uh, you know, that which is key, I think. I think a lot of it like cooking, like, you know, it tastes okay to me, but maybe maybe you have a slightly different palate. Maybe you're actually better at tasting than I am. So if this is too salty to you, how can I how can I adjust it? And not that the salt right. is a personal affront that I have, you know, done something terribly wrong, right? But like let's let's have a conversation about how this meal is turning out. Totally. Yeah, and that can be on levels uh, of things that maybe you just didn't see. So yeah, engaging in it, asking questions, apologizing, just saying I'm sorry. Great, good stuff. Okay, there's always more to say, and feel free to hit us up or tag us to the questions. More threads about this. Hopefully, we'll get some more uh, thoughts that people really, uh, really want to want to know more about. But to wrap up, uh, we want to just go around and say, what's a game people should be checking out and thinking about running on games on demand, or thinking about playing games on demand that really does interesting stuff with inclusion? Um, and we'll start over with Ajit. Just go down the list. What, what's a game people should be looking for right now? Sure. Uh, <laughs> the game that I'd say people should t check out that's been out for a while is uh, Brendan Taylor's How We Came to Live Here. Uh, I think it just does an amazing job at um, putting people in the skin of, of, uh, of a Native American character, the culture, the tribe, um, the the, uh, the myths. Um, it really, really pushes you into that skin uh, in a way that I've um, rarely seen before. Um, and I just love it. Great game. Go out there and play it. Uh, hopefully, they'll have it at games in demand. If not, maybe you know, bring a copy of the game and you know, do a pickup game with somebody at, at Gen Con. Great, great, Mendez. Uh, yeah, um, I was gonna, I was actually gonna cite uh, Ten Rabancho Zero um, as an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, perspective on this. Uh, so, Ten Rabancho Zero is a Japanese uh, RPG that represents sort of uh, a hyper Asian, hyper Japanese fantasy setting. Uh, but it was, it's actually, it was written in Japan. Um, so it's Japan's take on, it. it's Japan doing oriental adventures about itself. And um, it, does a, it does a really good job of upending and subverting a lot of those, uh, a lot of those tropes. Um, it's not a game that's completely unproblematic. The art 
is a little juvenile in some ways, but um, it's still a really, really interesting perspective um, that kind of throws off uh, throws off your standard expectations about um, about how you do a uh, how you do an East Asian setting. Great, cool, good, Kira. Uh, I also just want to support those two games. They're awesome, um, especially Tenor of Zero, Zero, uh, which I've played a lot, but. Um, uh, my game would be Dream is Q, uh, which is written by Avery McDonald and uh, is radically inclusive uh, when it comes to queer sexuality, um, queer game design, and gender uh, expression. Um, I think it's really interesting to play that game because it really does queer your worldview um, when you're playing that game. It does what I was talking about earlier. It takes uh, norms that we're used to, cultural norms, uh, you know, in the West, in the U.S., and uh, just subverts them. So suddenly you are in a, a queer setting, playing queer, queer characters, doing queer things. Um, and uh, as a queer woman, uh, that's important to me. And uh, it, it's also a really fun and fabulous game. So I'd recommend everybody play that. I'm also running it. It's GMless. It's very easy to run. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, those are all really good. I'm going to recommend a classic. Uh, Julia Ellen Bowes, Stillway Jordan, is just freaking amazing. Uh, number one, it is. I'm so running fun. it. It's, yeah, it's, so, it's first of all, it's super fun. Like people don't know that most all the games we just described are not games that we like. Sadly, put our time into like they're actually all awesome, fun, really cool games. Yeah. Um, I think you know we, none of us said Monster Hearts probably because we all know you're playing it anyway. So fine, go play Monster Hearts. These are, let's give you the stuff you're not playing already. Uh, but Sealaway Jordan doesn't get played enough, and I think it probably doesn't get played enough for one reason because, and this is true for me, I was a little freaked out about playing Slaves. You're like, man, that's, that's heavy. I don't know if I can do that well. But Julia's written a game that just, it just totally supports you as the player doing that well, you as the GM doing that well. And it's an awesome hero narrative, man. Like, you know who, you know who is a legitimate bad guy all the time? Nazis and slave owners. These are bad guys. Like, you kill them. Like, you know what? Yeah, totally. Yes. Great, right? I mean, Django, uh, Roots, like, these are, like, really core, awesome stories. And you want to be a hero. You're the guy that like tries to get out and free others as slaves. Like, man, awesome, awesome, right? And and so just being able to play that game and have it be so fun and so easy to pick up and learn and support what we're talking about doing here so well. I feel like Julia has been doing this work longer than I've been gaming. So I I, I just have utmost respect for her and what she's done. And it's a classic. Try it. Out. Yeah, please play it. I offer it every Gen Con, and no one ever plays it. So yeah, uh -huh. definitely, definitely worth checking out. All right, so uh, thank you all so much for coming, and thanks to those of you who have watched. We'll make this available for people to continue to watch and continue to check out. And we're still watching the comments, so if you need to ask us a question, drop a line, and we'll make sure that we get it answered. Uh, any final thoughts, anybody? No? Okay, great, wonderful. Thanks. It's been wonderful. Uh, let us know if you have any questions, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Bye, guys. Peace.